you know, the basic upshot is that I, I think recent progress in the foundations of quantum mechanics has raised genuinely new and puzzling and pretty urgent questions about exactly what it is that distinguishes the category of the gnomic from the category of the concrete. And I want to try to put some of those questions forcefully and explicitly on the table. Let me start out um, because I think it'll be helpful um, by talking a bit about the old project of trying to write down a relationalist version of Newtonian particle mechanics. This project has a long and complicated history and is, of, of course, it's a much less urgent project now than it was a century or two ago. Um, um, but anyway, it has a history that stretches back over hundreds of years to the beginning of Newtonian mechanics itself. And there's a lot, um, um, there's way too much of it to say anything comprehensive about it here. Let me just remind you of two of the highlights of this history. There's a Machian proposal about how to do this, um, that the inertial frames of reference, the frames of reference that is with respect to which F equals MA is a true law of nature, are the ones that are unaccelerated and unrotating with respect to what people used to call the bulk mass of the universe. And there's a beautiful and mathematically ingenious proposal due to Barbour um, in which the physically possible trajectories of the world turn out to be geodesics in what he calls a shape space whose points correspond to sets of interparticle distances. Both of these theories deny, as any properly relationalist theory should, that there is ever any fact of the matter about where anything is or about how anything is moving with respect to any background absolute space or with respect to anything other, anything other than other material bodies. And both of these theories deny, as any properly relationalist theory should, that there is any dynamical law that would apply to the case of a single material body alone in the universe. But both of them also have features that one might not initially think one wants in such a theory. Neither of them reproduces all of the purely relational consequences of Newtonian mechanics, and both of them include a curious kind of non-locality. Consider, for example, the case of a system, call it S, that consists of two masses connected by a spring. And suppose that at a certain particular moment, the distance between these two masses is somewhat greater than the relaxation length of the spring, and that the first derivative of that distance with respect to time happens to be zero. In an absolutist Newtonian mechanics, there are any number of different ways in which the distance between the masses might evolve with time. The distance might remain constant, which is what would happen if the system were rotating about its center at the appropriate angular velocity with respect to the background absolute space, or it might oscillate, which is what would happen if the rotation with respect to the absolute space were slower than in the previous case, or if it were zero. But in either of the relationalist theories I mentioned above, what will happen to a system like this is going to depend on what other systems there may or may not happen to be in the world that we are imagining. Even if those systems happen to be arbitrarily far away from us, and even if they happen to have no dynamical interaction whatsoever with us. Both of these theories entail, for example, that a system like S, if it's all alone in the universe, can only oscillate since in that case, the inertial frames are going to have to be the ones in which S itself is completely unrotating. And all of the continuous infinity of other, um, other substantivalist Newtonian solutions are simply going to disappear. But there is an astonishingly simple and trivial way of writing down a relationalist version of Newtonian particle mechanics that has all the advantages and none of the disadvantages of the two theories we've just been talking about, and which can be stated 
in its entirety as follows. Here's the theory. The physically possible sequences of interparticle distances are just the ones that have at least one faithful embedding into an Aristotelian spacetime such that on that embedding, they satisfy F equals MA. And what I mean, of course, by an embedding being faithful is that it preserves all the interparticle distances. This theory, let's call it the embedding theory, recovers the entirety of the relational consequences of, of the substantivalist version of Newtonian mechanics and nothing else. It has nothing like the non-locality of the theories we considered above. It's a theory that is in which any dynamically isolated system can be treated entirely on its own as if it were alone in the universe, just as we're used to doing in the absolutist version and so on. What's the trick here? How did we end up getting rid of space as a substance? What happens is that we absorb space into the category of law. And what's wrong with this? Why haven't people availed themselves of this? Why has everybody been knocking themselves out for so many hundreds of years, wasting their energy and their brilliance, torturing themselves with compromises when there was an utterly obvious and effortless and trivial move that could have gotten them absolutely everything they ever could have wanted. Well, let's see. There's a persistent accusation in the literature to the effect that a theory like this is somehow disingenuous, that it uses substantival Aristotelian spacetime, that it relies on the substantival Aristotelian spacetime, and then turns around and dismisses it as a fiction. But that just doesn't seem right to me. I don't think that the geometrical structure of Aristotelian space is ever being treated here as if it were the structure of some substantial thing. It seems to me that it's being treated from beginning to end as a breathtakingly concise and efficient mathematical device for expressing the content of purely relational laws. Suppose, for example, that I have a theory according to which the trajectories of particles have shapes that happen to look exactly like the profiles of unicorns. And suppose that I describe the content of that theory in exactly those terms. Is a theory like that, or this particular description of a theory like that, somehow disingenuously helping itself to unicorns only to turn around and dismiss them as a fiction? Of course not. The theory is merely availing itself of a compact and convenient device for expressing what it has to say about the motions of particles. And it seems to me that very much the same sort of thing is going on in the embedding theory. But there are more serious worries that can be raised about a theory like this. Some people, he and Dora, for example, have worried that the trick here the business that is of absorbing whatever it is we don't want in the concrete physical ontology into the category of, of the gnomic, Kean worries that, that moves like this are too easy. The worry in particular is that you can do this once you get the hang of it to anything. Suppose, for example, that you'd like to remove some particular particle, or that you'd like to remove all the particles except for the ones inside your head, or that you would like to remove whatever particular particles you don't happen to like from the universal catalog of concrete physical things. Suppose that is that you'd like to remove some particular M of the particles mentioned in the standard Newtonian theory of the world, any M of those particles that you like and leave the, only the remaining N particles. Here's how to write down an, the Newtonian theory of the motions of the N particles that you've decided to hang on to. Here's the theory. The physically possible motions of the N existing particles are just the ones that have at least one faithful embedding into a larger collection of N plus M particles floating around in background at Aristotelian absolute spacetime in accord with F equals MA. 
What's going on here is that we've absorbed the M particles that we don't like into the laws of the motions of the N particles that we do like. I hope I'm pronouncing M and N sufficiently distinctly. Okay, um, sorry, I should have chosen other letters. What's going on here is that we've absorbed the M particles that we don't like into the laws of the motion of the N particles that we do like. Just as we absorb the space that we don't like into the laws of the evolutions of the interparticle distances that we do like in the example above. And now it begins to look as if this sort of a trick is going to allow you to get rid of anything you don't happen to like. And this is what seems to be worrying people like Kean. But I think this is a little too fast. The theory we've been entertaining just now is in all sorts of, in all sorts of ways and in stark contrast to the relationalist theory that we were talking about before, a mess and a joke and a failure. Note to begin with that the relationalist theory we were talking about before is deterministic. On that theory, the sequence of interparticle distances over any arbitrarily short interval uniquely determines the entire sequence out to t equals minus infinity and t equals plus infinity. But the present theory, the one about the n particles we happen to like, gives us no law-like connections at all, not deterministic ones and not chancy ones either, between the positions of the n existent particles at one time and their positions and velocities at some other time, or between the positions of the particles at one time and their positions throughout some non-overlapping finite interval of time, or between the positions of the particles at one time and their positions throughout some non-overlapping semi-infinite interval at that time. Nothing. Here's an easy way to see that. Imagine that one of the n fake particles never interacts with any of the n real particles until a certain time Tc, at which it collides with real particle number 14, altering number 14's direction of motion. In that case, nothing in the motions of the n real particles all the way from t equals minus infinity up to t sub c is going to offer any hint at all um, of what that fake particle is doing or of when or how or whether it might be expected to interfere with the motions of any of the real particles. And so there are clearly going to be a continuous infinity of different trajectories of the n real particles, all of which are fully in accord with the laws of this theory and all of which exactly and entirely coincide with one another for all times prior to this time of the first collision, t equals t sub c. And note that it's not going to do so much as an iota of good at this point to relent and to allow one or two or three of the banished m particles back into the catalog of concrete physical things. Letting any proper subset back in is going to do nothing whatsoever. But the minute you let all of them back in, then poof, you have a recognizably dynamical theory. And not, mind you, just any recognizably dynamical theory, but the best and most informative and most explanatory kind of recognizable dynamical theory, a fully deterministic theory. And so it feels here as if the world is palpably screaming at you um, that all of the particles are concrete physical things. And that the business of trying to absorb so much as a single one of them into the domain of the gnomic is just a mistake. And nothing like that goes on in the case of the analogous, analogous relationalist theory that we were talking about before. Let's try a slightly different tack. What if we want again to find some way of absorbing the M particles that we don't like into the laws of the motions of the N particles that we do like. How about this? 
the physically possible motions of the n existing particles are just the ones that have at least one faithful embedding into a larger collection of n plus m particles, where the positions and velocities of the m auxiliary particles, this, the fake ones, are specified at some time t, um, uh, at some specified time t, excuse me, are stipulated to be x1 through x3m and v1 through v3m floating around in a background Aristotelian space-time in accord with f equals ma. In this theory, unlike the previous one, the law makes explicit reference to some particular set of, init of initial positions and velocities for the m fake particles. So this theory, unlike the previous one, is going to be fully deterministic. But note that the price of that determinism is going to be a fantastically complicated law of motion for the n real particles. So the theory in question here is going to be perverse in a different way. Moreover, the set of physically possible motions of the n real particles on this theory is going to be fantastically smaller than it is on the familiar Newtonian mechanical theory of the n plus m real particles, and fantastically smaller than we intuitively suppose it to be, because the physical motions of those n real particles here are going to be restricted to the ones that are compatible with one particular set of initial conditions for the m fake particles. And finally, there is a very simple, uh, there's the very simple observation that it just doesn't make any physical sense to distinguish in the way we've been doing here between the n real particles and the m fake ones, since the mathematical structure of the theory treats all of them in a completely identical way. And so, once again, the theory seems to be insisting that the m fake particles are in fact not one with, not one with less real and concrete and substantial than the n real ones. And let me remind you again um, that none of these sorts of worries arise in connection with the project of absorbing space-time into the laws in the way that we were discussing above. Okay, there's an analogous dialectic that one can go through with, say, Maxwellian electrodynamics. This one turns out to be a little bit less one-sided and a little bit more interesting than the one about the unwanted particles. Suppose then that we like to think of all of our particles as real, concrete, physical things, but not any of our fields. Suppose that is that we should like to find some way of absorbing the fields into the laws of the motions of the particles. Here's a first attempt at doing something like that. Here's the theory. The physically possible motions of the particles are just the ones that have at least one faithful embedding into an Aristotelian spacetime decorated with an electromagnetic field such that the whole business, particles plus fields, satisfies the equation of, equations of Maxwellian electrodynamics. This is manifestly going to have the same sorts of problems as the first of the strategies we considered above for getting rid of all the unwanted particles, which is that there really isn't anything much like a dynamics here at all, not a deterministic one and not a chancy dynamics either. Suppose that is that there's some particular bump or dimple in the electromagnetic field. Suppose, for example, that there's some particular ray of light that never interacts with any of the particles until a certain time Tc, at which time it collides with particle number 14, altering particle 14's direction of motion. In that case, nothing in the motions of any of the particles, all the way from T equals minus infinity up to T sub C, is going to offer any hint at all of what that ray of light is doing, or when, or how, or whether it might be expected to interfere with the motions of any of the particles. And so there are clearly going to be a continuous infinity of different trajectories of all of the particles, all of which are fully in accord with this theory, and all of which exactly and entirely coincide with one another, 
for all times prior to the time of this collision, t equals t sub c. And in order to cure this disease, some, and if, excuse me, in order to cure this disease, some particular initial electromagnetic field configuration is incorporated into the explicit statement of the law, then the law will be deterministic, but it is also, as we saw, as with the particle case, going to be perversely complicated, um, much more complicated indeed than in the previous example with the particles. And here again, there's going to be a vastly smaller set of physically possible evolutions of the particles than we're naturally inclined to think. In this case, unlike in the case of the particle theory, there's not going to be a worry about our having chosen to remove something from the ontology that has exactly the same sort of mathematical description in the theory as something else that we've chosen to leave in. But there is a general worry which has much the same form and which seems to me to have much the same force to the effect that we're removing something here that is the field that bears the unmistakable signature of stuff. I'm not sure how to say this with even remotely as much precision and explicitness as it needs to be said. But the intuition is that all of the chaos and ugliness and arbitrariness and complexity of the, of the world has to do almost as a matter of conceptual analysis with the arrangement of the concrete fundamental physical stuff. The intuition is that it's the very essence of stuff to be in general a mess, and that it's the very essence of laws to be clean and simple. Or that, at any rate, is the best I can do at the moment. And that's enough to see, yet again, that no such worry is going to arise in the case of the relationalist uh, embedding theory that we started out with. Anyway. These questions of what counts as a physical law and what counts as a physical thing have become particularly serious and particularly urgent. And this is really why I'm discussing them here um, in the context of discussions of the ontology of the quantum mechanical wave function. Let's think of wave functions here, just so as to have something particular, uh, uh, excuse me, Let's think of wave functions here just so as to have some particular mathematical formalism explicitly on the table in the context of Bohmian mechanics. Although I don't think that's going to very much limit the generality of what I want to say. Bohmian mechanical wave functions, somewhat like Maxwellian electromagnetic fields, push material particles around. But Bohmian mechanical wave functions, unlike Maxwellian electromagnetic fields, don't live in the three-dimensional space of our everyday experience of the world. They live instead in a space of three n dimensions, where n is the total number of elementary particles in the universe. And the business of incorporating three n dimensional objects, three n, excuse me, dimensional objects, into the ontology of concrete physical things has made many investigators of the foundations of quantum mechanics distinctly and conspicuously uncomfortable. And there is a well-known and widely discussed strategy for ameliorating this discomfort, the strategy of so-called primitive ontology, which is to remove those objects, that is the wave functions, from the category of concrete physical things and to absorb them in one way or another into the category of laws. And the obvious options for doing something like that um, are very much the same in the case of quantum mechanical wave functions, at least in Bohmian mechanics, as they were in the case of the electromagnetic field. We can write down laws of the motions of the Bohmian mechanical particles that include an explicit specification of an initial wave function. And we can write down laws of the motions of those particles that do not include a specific specification of the initial wave function. Um, just paralleling what we did in the Maxwellian case and in the, in the 
particles we don't like case. If the laws don't include an, ex an explicit specification of the initial wave function, then as in the previous examples we considered, there aren't really gonna turn out to be any, any dynamical laws at all, neither deterministic ones nor chancy ones. And if the laws do include an explicit specification of the initial wave function, then they run the risk of being too complicated and too messy and too contingent looking to be taken seriously as laws. Indeed, vis-a-vis -vis this last point, there are important differences between the mechanism whereby electromagnetic fields push particles around and the mechanism whereby Bohmian mechanical wave functions push particles around. And the latter of these two mechanisms, the Bohmian one, which is called the Bohmian guidance condition, turns out to require that every single individual twist and turn in the trajectory of every single individual one of the particles in the universe be encoded in some distinct and individual bump or dimple in the wave function. So the Bohmian mechanical wave function, unlike the Maxwellian electromagnetic field, uh, cannot be so much as a single informational byte less complicated than the compre or more compressible than the complete particulate history of the universe. And again, as we found in both the case of our attempts to remove some of the particles from Newtonian mechanics, um, and as we found in the case of our attempts to remove the fields from Maxwellian electrodynamics, the number and variety of physically possible evolutions of the Bohmian corpuscles is gonna be much smaller if we go the deterministic route than we would intuitively have thought. Let's try something else. Something that comes out of the literature on the foundations of statistical mechanics. It's now more and more widely acknowledged in the literature of the foundations of statistical mechanics that the fundamental laws of nature include probability distributions over initial conditions. And this suggests a new and more sophisticated strategy for absorbing unwanted pieces of ontology into the laws. A strategy in which the laws into which the unwanted pieces of ontology get absorbed turn out to be stochastic. Suppose, for example, that there are m particles, m, um, that we would like to remove from the universal catalog of concrete material things by absorbing them into the laws. Start with the prohibitively complicated deterministic theory that we discussed above the one in which some particular set of initial conditions for the M particles that we don't like, um, uh, in which those initial conditions are explicitly incorporated into the laws of the motions of the N particles that we do like. And consider a probability distribution over such deterministic laws of motion, the one induced by the usual statistical mechanical probability distribution over initial conditions of the original N plus M particle universe, the one induced that is by the usual statistical mechanical mentaculus of the N plus M particle universe. This will yield a single stochastic law of motion for the remaining n real particles, starting from any particular set of initial positions and velocities of the n real particles. This law will give us a probability distribution over future classical trajectories of those particles. This escapes the obvious drawback of the deterministic strategy that we considered above, which is to say, it is not particularly complicated, and yet it manages to deliver a real dynamical law of motion. But this too, for all sorts of other reasons, turns out, it seems to me, not to be an attractive theory. It turns out, you might say, to be divided at every turn against itself. Here's what I mean. On the one hand, this theory stipulates that M of its particles are fake. 
which is to say that it stipulates, among other things, that there are no determinate facts of the matter at any particular time about where those M fake particles are or about how they're moving. But the theory also entails that the M fake particles are exactly as detectable as the N real ones. And it entails that the positions and the velocities of the M fake particles at any particular time can be measured by exactly the same procedure and with exactly the same instruments as one uses to measure the positions and the velocities of the N real particles. And it follows, for example, that nothing is going to stand in the way of our confirming by experiment and with every bit as much accuracy and with every bit as much certainty as we're able to do in the context of ordinary Newtonian mechanics, that the measurable properties of any isolated collection of real and fake particles at any time t are going to uniquely determine the positions of all of the real particles in that collection. And while we're at it, all of the fake ones too, but we don't care about those, at any other time t prime, so long as the collection remains isolated between t and t prime. And so there turns out to be something false there turns out to be something hollow about the alleged chanciness of a theory like this. It's true on this theory that the histories of all of the concrete physical items in the world up to any particular time t do not uniquely determine the histories of those items after t. But it's also true that the physically measurable properties of the world at any one time on this theory do uniquely determine the physically measurable properties of the world at all other times. And nothing like that is the case of any of the fundamental theories of the world that we're usually inclined to regard as genuinely and legitimacy, legitimately chancy. Think of something like the GRW theory, for example. Nothing like this is going to be true of the GRW theory. There are no measurements we can perform that are, that are going to determine how these measurements come out later on. And a similar thing happens in this theory with invariance under time translation. The law of the motions of the n real particles on a theory like this one is going to have to include a probability distribution over positions and velocities of the m fake particles that's stipulated to obtain at some particular time. And so, even if we're given a complete specification of the positions and the velocities and the internal properties of the n real particles in the world, up to and including some particular temporal instant t, the probability that the theory associates with the proposition that the particles are going to swerve this way just after t as a result, for example, of colliding with one or another of the fake particles are going to depend on what time t happens to be. And so there is a certain literal sense in which a theory like this is certainly not invariant, that is even its dynamical part is not invariant under time translation. But, the, but you know, this is going to be the same shtick as we went through before. Um, the world that this theory describes is nevertheless going to present, just as the last one did, every last one of the observable signs and symptoms of invariance, of dynamical invariance under time translation, just as it presents every last one of the observable signs and symptoms of determinism. And so there remains, even in this more sophisticated theory, a sense in which the mathematical structure of nature is palpably screaming at us that the fake particles which have been absorbed into the laws of motion of the real ones are really concrete physical things. And there is a unique and obvious and minimal modification of this theory, which will leave it fully and explicitly invariant under time translation. And there is also a unique and obvious and minimal modification of this theory, which will leave it fully and explicitly deterministic. And it happens that those two modifications are exactly one in the same, namely 
the reification of the M particles that we have here declared to be fake. And we can play very much the same game again with Maxwellian electromagnetism. We want to remove the electromagnetic fields from the category of concrete physical things. And we do so by absorbing them into the laws of the motions of the particles. We start as above with the prohibitively complicated deterministic theory that we talked about above, the one in which some particular set of initial conditions of the electromagnetic fields that we want to remove are explicitly incorporated into the laws of the motions of the particles. And then we make this same move of considering a probability distribution over such deterministic laws of motion, the one induced by the usual statistical mechanical probability distribution over initial conditions, the one that is induced, that is, by the usual statistical mechanical mentaculus of all the particles and electromagnetic fields in the universe. And this distribution will yield a single, simple, stochastic law of the motions of the particles, a law which, moreover, is not invariant under time translations. But all this turns out to be exactly as hollow in the case of Maxwellian electrodynamics as it was in the case of Newtonian mechanics. The theory stipulates that there are no facts of the matter about the strengths and the directions of the electromagnetic fields at any particular point in space-time. But it also entails that those strengths and those directions can all be measured with instruments constructed entirely out of the particles. I'm sorry for the noise of ambulances uh, outside. Can people hear me? Sure, sure. Yeah. OK, good. Um, the theory stipulates that there are no facts of the matter about the strengths and the directions of the electromagnetic fields at any particular point in space-time, but it also entails that those strengths and those directions can all be measured with instruments constructed entirely out of the particles. And so, as before, there's a technical sense in which the theory is stochastic, and there's a technical sense in which it fails to be invariant under time translations, but it will also present every one of the observational signs and symptoms of being precisely the opposite of both of those things. And these things will go pretty much the same way yet again if we play the game with Bohmian mechanics. I won't, I won't drag you through that example. It goes pretty much in parallel to the examples we've just considered. Okay. I know of one further strategy along these lines. Um, the most recent and most interesting and most sophisticated um, of them all for removing the Bohmian mechanical wave function from the category of concrete physical things and absorbing it into the category of law. This is the so-called Wentaculus picture of my friend Eddie Chen, who's who's with us today. And I want to finish up by talking some about that. Eddie's picture begins with a version of Bohmian mechanics in which the particles are guided around not by a wave function, but by a density matrix. The velocities of the particles at any particular time on this theory are going to be more or less the weighted averages one associates with the ordinary Bohmian wave function that are incoherently mixed together, uh, excuse me, the velocities of the particles at any particular time on this theory are going to be more or less the weighted averages of the ones associated with the ordinary Bohmian wave functions that are incoherently mixed together in the universe's density matrix. And on this picture, what we get from the past hypothesis is not a probability distribution over wave functions, but a single determinate initial density matrix. One then declares that this density matrix is not a concrete physical object, but part of the law of the motions of the particles. And one now obtains a real dynamical law of the motions of the particles, which is not only simple, but also fully deterministic. What probabilities there are can all be traced back 
just as they are in ordinary Bohmian mechanics, to the familiar probability distribution over the, over the initial positions of the particles. And the overall probability of any particular particles being located at any particular place at any particular time is going to be demonstrably exactly the same on this theory as it would be in ordinary Bohmian mechanics with the corresponding statistical mechanical probability distribution over initial wave functions. Good. This is a really brilliant proposal, um, I think. Um, but I guess I'm also worried that there may be a trouble here as well. The trouble in a nutshell is that this theory, although it's going to give us exactly the same overall probabilities of any particular particles being located at any particular place at any particular time, as we get from ordinary Bohmian mechanics with the corresponding statistical mechanical probability distribution over initial possible wave functions, um, although it's going to do that, which is good, it's often going to produce, produce trajectories that are altogether physically impossible on ordinary Bohmian mechanics and altogether at odds with what we ordinarily take to be our empirical experience of the world. Consider, for example, the very simple case of a universe that contains only a single material particle confined to move in a single spatial dimension. And suppose that the density matrix of the universe that we start out with represents an incoherent mixture of two wave functions, both eigenstates of momentum, one of which has momentum plus one and the other of which has momentum minus one. On ordinary Bohmian mechanics, a particle like this will either be uniformly moving in the plus direction or it will be uniformly moving in the minus direction, each with equal probability of a half. And the probability of this particles being located at any particular point at any particular time will be equal to the probability of its being located at any other particular point at that particular time. But note that on the Wentaculus picture, although the probability of the particles being located at any particular spatial point at any particular time will be identical to the corresponding probability in the ordinary Bohmian mechanical mentaculus, the particle in this case, in the Wentaculus case, is going to be entirely and permanently and with certainty at rest. Whereas in the Bohmian mentaculus case, it's either going to be moving to the left or moving to the right with velocity one the whole time. So there is an obvious sense in which the Bohmian Wentaculus is going to be observationally indistinguishable from the Bohmian Mentaculus, since those two pictures are going to agree on the overall probabilities at any particular time of all of the possible particulate configurations of the world. But there's a sense in which this disagreement, this agreement, excuse me, doesn't go very deep, or at least there's a worry that it may not go very deep. Um, here's what I mean. The mentaculus entails that the sorts of configurations of particles that we're ordinarily inclined to regard as records of certain particular experiments having been performed and of those experiments having come out in certain particular ways. I'm thinking here of things like the configurations of molecules on a photographic emulsion or configurations of molecules of ink in experimental notebooks or configurations of charged particles in digital electronic recording devices or what have you. Um, okay. Um, um, so let me just read. So although the probabilities of those configurations are all going to be exactly what they are in the ordinary Bohmian mentaculus case. Um, um, I'm sorry, let me, let me start this sentence again. Good. 
The mentaculus entails that these configurations that I just described can generally be relied upon as evidence that those particular experiments that they seem to be records of were actually performed and that they did actually come out in those particular ways. But we've just seen that the trajectories that lead up to those configurations can be vastly different in the Bohmian Wentaculus than they are in the Bohmian Mentaculus. And so there seems to be no prima facie reason to be confident that the reliability of those configurations as evidence of those experiments is going to be preserved as we move from the Bohmian Mentaculus to Eddy's Bohmian Wentaculus. And unless we're, unless we're able to find such a reason, um, it looks to me like the right way of thinking about the Wentaculus is more as a brilliant skeptical hypothesis um, than as a serious scientific theory. Okay, um, that's, I'm, I'm gonna stop now because I'm just about at the end of my time. Um, let me just say by summing up, this is all very preliminary, nothing very deep or very general or very definitive, I think follows from any of this. Um, um, indeed, it's intended, um, as I said at the outset, not so much to promulgate a position as to raise a family of questions and to provoke a wider conversation. We're at a juncture now in the foundations of quantum mechanics at which further progress, I think, is going to require, among other things, that we come to some better and deeper and more stable understanding than we presently seem to have of what sorts of things fit naturally into the category of the gnomic and what sorts of things fit naturally into the category of the concrete and what sorts of things might be freely deposited in the light or under the pressure of other sorts of considerations into whichever of those categories we wish. Thanks. I will start uh, from Eddie. Please, Eddie, go ahead. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Antonio, to you. That is great talk and really exciting and very helpful stuff. Um, do you want to say that really clarify for me the kind of connections between various uh, among various issues, such as mechanic, quantum mechanics, and so on, and space and time? I just want to, um, so maybe a small point and then a major kind of comment. The first small point is about the, um, uh, the ventaculus picture uh, in the end. Um, I think you summarized correctly about the uh, general structure of the, the picture uh, that we have a mixture uh, as a fundamental density matrix here. Um, but I think you have in mind different kind of law of motion using the density oh. matrix than the one uh -huh. that I have in mind. Oh. So, um, um, so one can have, um, you know, think about the usual Bohmian mechanics picture uh, taking greater than the wave function um, and using the average of those by averaging of the velocity of several wave functions. Right. In the case of two momentum eigenstates, one going to left, one going to right, so average zero. Um, or you can take the gradient of the fundamental density matrix, right? And um, or the the probability the probability current will give you the um, velocity. In this case, there will be uh, some configurations in the middle that will not be moving either to the left or right. But if you start from say um, you know. Uh, away from the center line of the two um, wave packets moving away, then what could be carried by this wave? Or oh, this way, one goes. No, no, this no, 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 Eddie. But what? What if you have? What if? What if the initial state is uh, is two momentum eigenstates, one to mm -hmm. the left, one to the right. Mm -hmm. A mixture. First of all, of those. we're thinking about uh, wave functions, and momentum eigenstates are not really in the Hilbert space wave functions. Yeah, so, but I mean, I, is it going to hinge on that? I mean, well, I don't, I, I'm just trying to think through a very simple mm -hmm. case here, okay? If we have, you know, that is, I don't want the packets to be confined in any way that's relevant to stuff we're interested in, okay? So maybe there, there's weird stuff going on very, very far away, okay? But we basically got two momentum eigenstates. Okay, then I think on the theory you're talking about as well, 
the particle is going to be stationary more or less everywhere. Neglect what's going on at the edges. Um, but if you have the kind of realistic wave functions, right, with some variations in space. But, but wait, this wasn't supposed to be a realistic case. This was supposed to be just trying to get a grip on what's going on, okay? Here's the structure of the worry, okay? Um, the structure of the worry is this theory by construction is gonna give us the same position probabilities as a function of time as, as ordinary mentaculous um, Bohmian mechanics is gonna give us, okay? The worry is that, that at least it, there are simple cases. Now, maybe, there, maybe this depends on something about the way this case is simplified or idealized. That would be great. And, 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 and maybe the worry goes away in more realistic cases. It does depend uh, uh, on this realization. Okay, I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, that'll be interesting to see. Right. Here's the structure of the worry, okay? The structure of the worry here is, Ha, look, I can think of this simple idealized case to be sure, okay, where um, the probability of the particles being at certain being at a certain configuration is exactly the same as in the mentaculus, okay, right. as a mm -hmm. function of time. But the ways that they get there are completely different. Okay. Um, um, in the mentaculus, they get there by moving at either plus one or minus one. In the wentaculus, they get there by just staying where they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, in more realistic cases, the differences maybe won't be that dramatic. I mean, th this is, I yeah, think, really any interesting. variation in space for the wave functions, right? Yeah. It's not it's some almost momentum eigenstates. Yeah. With some variation to the left. Compared to the right, yeah. and there'll be some variation in space. No, no, there'll be a little, the but, the, the, but the ways they get there will still be very different, okay, than they would have been, or at least that's the way it's looking. So there will not I, that's be a skeptical challenge about. here, right? So the skeptical that's challenge right. is that for every situation in macroscopic experiments we do, Good. Stern Gallag, double Good. slit, Good. and all of those. The, the trajectories are the ones we right. think they are. That's right. That's yeah, there will be different trajectories, of course, right? Um, but even Bowman mechanics itself, you can have different guidance equations. No, 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 no. Skepticism no. Yet, yes, right? yes, of course. What we want is, what, here's, here's the minimum that we want, okay? We want it to be the case that the trajectories aren't so different, okay? That they end up entailing what we normally take to be evidence of the past, not to be evidence of the past. Right. Okay, that's what we want. Because uh, now this theory may still be um, empirically adequate, okay? But it's gonna, but if you put it beside a theory, you know, if we've got another theory that endorses our, our usual beliefs about the past and so on, and is just as good empirically, then that's gonna be a big disadvantage. That is, here, here's the worry. The worry hmm. is this theory is something like Bell's version of Everett where the particle Question is mark. just yeah. jumping around yeah. all over the it's place. It's not, right? We'll talk about this. this no, 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 no. It's, it's not no, jumpy, no, 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 right? No, of course. No, no, right. it's not. I, I, all I mean is the worry is that it shares with that, okay, um, um, this feature that what we normally take to be evidence of the past, okay, doesn't end up counting as evidence of the past. And like I say, I, the, I haven't done anything like show that that's the case here, okay? I've raised a worry in a simple case, okay? Right. Um, it may be that, that the way I raise this worry depends on all kinds of idealizations mm -hmm. and that the minute those idealizations are relaxed, everything falls into place. Although- It's like Einstein's box case, right? That, 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 oh. It's like what? Einstein's box thought experiment when you have uh, uh, real wave functions in the box and so on. I mean, I don't know. So, so I don't know. So, so, so no, I agree with you. Thing. These trajectories uh, are continuous. Yeah. Okay. Trajectories can be continuous and still be crazy. Okay. The, the reason that we have evidence for experiments and recordings right. uh, for the theory is, like you said, the past hypothesis. And both theories, both in Mantaculus and the Ventaculus, have 
the past hypothesis. One says, you know, distribution over wave functions. The other is a mixture of wave function density right. matrix. But Eddie, now what? that is not a mixture of my momentum eigenstates. It I is agree. a mixture of normal wave functions. I, I um, agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, 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 so I'm not seeing the skeptical challenge yet. <laughs> um, here, here's the worry. Okay, um, like I say, the worry is when I when I write down the simplest case I can think of, just because it's easy to calculate in one second. Okay, it gives me position probabilities that match the mentaculous ones. Okay but trajectory probabilities that are completely different, okay? Um, so um, so uh, to put it a little colorfully, it gives me the same probabilities that the particles are where they are, right. but very different stories about how they got there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, and unless we're gonna be in a kind of skeptical situation, that had better not be true in more realistic cases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. Okay, um, that's all that's going on here. You're absolutely right that the worry is based on a case which is in all kinds of ways idealized. Okay, and maybe those idealizations are somehow crucial. I mean, I've tried to think this through a little bit and I can't completely see my way through it. Um, maybe those idealizations are somehow crucial. Maybe the minute those idealizations are relaxed, we're going to snap back into a situation where particles do get to the places where they are by the roots, which we usually think they get to them. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Here's one case, highly idealized, in which they don't. Okay. Um, um, this is just a question put on the table. Oh, should I worry about this? Um, um, help me out, okay? Right. That that that's the that's the kind of structure of the dialectic as I, as I understand it at the moment. That, does right. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, David. Good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Next in line, we have Pedro. Okay, thank you, Antonio. Thank you so much, Professor Albert. I really enjoyed your. You well talk. Uh, oh, thank you. It was a vast array of topics. So in this uh, first round of questions, because I got a bunch of them, just uh, uh, a remark on one of the things you've said at the very beginning mm -hmm. regarding the Julian Barber's uh, theories. Uh -huh. If I got it right, you said that that theory requires basically a non-local, I mean, truly non-local, generally non-local character. Right. To describe dynamics. Right. And, well, I would like to disagree. Oh, okay. Maybe because, I'm wrong uh, about that. I mean, here's what I'm thinking. Let me just, let me just, um, and maybe I'm just wrong. I thought at least, and there may be several versions of Barbour's theory. The one I'm familiar with requires, as Mach's theory does, that the total angular momentum of the universe is by definition zero. Mm -hmm. that, well, and, and that's what I'm that, that's what I'm referring to as the non-local aspect. Oh, okay. Um, but actually, in, in in yeah, you are right that there's been a development of uh, Julian's ideas over three four decades. So. Mm -hmm. The one that requires that the total angular momentum be zero mm -hmm. is basically uh, through his uh, well-known best matching criteria that he developed right. with uh, Bruno Bertotti right. in the eighties. Right. Now, but that doesn't mean, and that's my point, that doesn't mean that basically that dynamics that describe the evolution of physical system is non-local. And by non-local, I mean that basically that a particle, the evolution of that of, of a particle, saying the Newtonian embody system for simplicity, doesn't require any condition set on that far away particle that basically is uh, roughly isolated with. And this is something that has been uh, done, well, 
three, four, five years ago in collaboration with uh, son of my collaborator that I, I felt like stepping in. I see. And so those collaborators of Julian's, along with Julian himself, uh, put forward elaborating on these ideas on, on Machian views that basically you describe the, the purely dynamics of, of your theory. I mean, it's able to for structures and to form a structure and stable records, which in an appropriate limit, they, they call in terms of complexity, but when this complexity gets, uh, goes uh, secular growth, this is one of the key uh, things of this uh, complexity function, it's uh, secular growth. In that kind of limit, these uh, particles get ever more isolated and correspondingly, they get ever more conserved charges, like I see. total energy, total uh -huh. momentum. Uh -huh. So it's true that in Julian's view, in, in this Machian sense, you start with basically a closed system, right. basically the whole universe. Right. But once you do that, your own dynamics is able to basically mimic in an appropriate and very definite sense, reproduce the, basically the dynamics of subsystem in standard Newtonian mechanics. I see. Also it's I being see. expanding to cosmological models as well. So I see. Okay, thank you. I, I, so I wasn't aware of this, of this recent uh, uh, stuff. Um, thank you. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear more about that um, if, you, if, if there's papers you can refer me to or something like that. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely, absolutely. Great. I will, uh, the second round. Get okay, back. great, okay. sure, sure. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. I, I take the liberty to step in with a, with a follow-up on, on this issue on uh, um, non-locality, uh, uh, because uh, I would like to, the, to walk the shoes of a metaphysician. And a metaphysician might say, okay, if uh, your theory is non-local in the sense you have discussed, so what? I mean, the spirit, uh, the, the Machian spirit that wants to be highlighted is in fact that uh, uh, all things are interrelated in a sort of holistic way. And the spirit is in fact reflected also in models of general relativity. I'm thinking about the work on uh, uh, frame dragging uh, made by some physicists. Uh, right where they basically build up uh, a general relativistic model where uh, inertial frames are totally um, determined by the surrounding- uh, Yeah, yeah, no, that physicians. might be true. That, uh, I mean, that might perfectly well be true. I guess I was thinking of myself as conducting a sort of more formal exercise here. Okay, that is just to see if we can do the following, put aside the question of whether doing this thing is particularly desirable on a deep physical level or not. We start out with the Newtonian theory. Okay, is there a way of hanging on to the purely relationalist consequences of Newtonian mechanics and throwing away all the rest, okay? Can we produce a clean... Now you're, you're saying, perfectly rightly, who says we should wanna hang on to all of the purely relationalist consequences? Maybe we should be changing some of them. Maybe we should be sacrificing some of them. That's fine. Okay, um, um, and there may be all kinds of good physical reasons to do this. And like I said at the beginning, this business of coming up with a relationalist version of Newtonian mechanics is not a particularly urgent question anymore. Anyway, nobody thinks anything like Newtonian mechanics is anything like correct, okay. Um, the issue is just, suppose somebody wanted, which most of these people claimed they wanted initially, to find a way of expressing all of the consequences of Newtonian mechanics vis-a-vis -vis interparticle distances and not committing themselves to anything else, okay? Is there an easy way to do that, okay? Yeah, this embedding strategy. You don't have to knock yourself out. It's one line. Um, there's nothing to it, okay? Um, 
Um, that was the point there. So I completely agree with you and also with the previous speaker um, uh, questioner. There may be all kinds of interesting contemporary physical reasons to entertain the kinds of non-locality that you're talking about vis-a-vis -vis frame dragging. Um, um, no dispute at all, no dispute at all. I was using the Newtonian mechanical example as a case of a formal exercise. Suppose you want a theory, you've, you start with a theory like X and you want a theory like Y, okay? Can you do it, okay? Um, because this was supposed to be analogous to what we're stuck with in the quantum mechanical case. But yeah, I think there may be all kinds of other and more contemporarily relevant reasons to entertain theories like that. I agree, I agree. And, and you're right. I shouldn't have said, I shouldn't have used words about the, the theories like bad um, um, or something like that. Um, I just should have made it clear that, it, that it, it wasn't doing this particular formal thing, leaving the theory unmolested, except uh, with the only difference that, that you had gotten rid of all references to absolute space. Yeah, good, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you very much. Okay, so we can go on with the Hans. Please go ahead, Hans. Thank you. I'm fascinated by the idea to distinguish between what is stuff and what is laws. Mm -hmm. I think that, that that seems to be a fundamental issue of the discussion which you, you want to stimulate. Right. And it, it really gets me. And so you gave the example of, of, of classical mechanics. I mean, you thought about it from the perspective of classical mechanics. You thought about it from the perspective of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. But if I want to do something really fundamental, I want to recognize something really fundamental, I think one should also look at it from the perspective of quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. Because for me, quantum mechanics is always a bit um, shaky because I consider it to be a limit of quantum field theory. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so I feel more comfortable if you can talk right away about the, the presently more complete and, and probably more reliable theory. Right, right. And so in, in quantum field theory, we have this nice feature that um, stuff can be created. I mean, an, an, an electron flying around or any charged particle can emit a photon. And so there is new particles, new stuff is created. I mean, they can carry energy. You can even violate the conservation of energy for a short time at least. And so there's a lot of flexibility that shows that stuff can appear or disappear and in a sense it's it's in the fundamental laws i would think in the interaction laws or in the underlying theory of electromagnetism that the creation and annihilation of stuff is is is, is kind of um organized or, or built in yeah, so so there's the suggestion that one should think about quantum field theory even more than about quantum mechanics. So, sorry. And the question yeah. of whether whether this yeah changes everything anything essential or the possibility of where where the law stuff borderline should be. Whether right. I mean, for, for me it's new to think about it, but maybe you have some comments to offer. I mean, I I have. Um, um, just a few very preliminary things to say. I guess the way I would, you know, my first naive inclination about thinking about the ontology of quantum field theories is that what is, you know, um, um, the thing that is to relativistic quantum field theories as particles are to non-relativistic first quantized quantum theories are fields, not particles, okay? So that, so, that, so that if you were to think this way, you would think about things like particles, not as the stuff itself, but as sort of excitations of the, you know, as, as names for various excited states of the stuff or names for various vibratory states of the stuff where you're thinking of the stuff naively as quantum fields, okay? Then 
once that naive picture is in place, if that naive picture is in place, then the same question as ari uh, arises in quantum field theories as arises in ordinary quantum mechanics. What's the ontological status of the wave functional in, in quantum field theories? Okay. Um, um, and then, and then you know you're, you're going to be able to have all kinds of proposals. You can you can treat that as a concrete object. You can do what people like Eddie are trying to do, finding ways of absorbing it into the category of law, um, so on and so forth. So, I I yeah, I think there's going to be a bunch of parallel um, discussions in the case of quantum field theory. My hope is. Uh, you know, and this is the hope, you know, having this hope is a disease that people who work in, in foundations of quantum mechanics always have. Um, um, the hope is that what we can learn about issues, foundational issues in, in quantum mechanics, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, is at least going to substantially translate um, into the quantum field theoretic um, domain, but there's always a risk that that they won't. But if I were to talk naively based on that hope, that's the kind of thing I would say. That first of all, the thing whose relation to quantum field theory is like the relation of particles to non-relativistic quantum mechanics isn't particles; it's fields. Okay, and. Uh, and, and so the, the sort of naively identified fundamental stuff would be fields and you would be thinking about particles as certain states of the fields, certain excitations of the fields, certain vibratory modes of the fields, um, so on and so forth. And once you were there, then you'd start playing the same game as we've been playing in foundations of quantum mechanics. Okay, what about the wave function or the wave functional in the case of quantum field theory? Um, there are going to be people running around like me proposing that that's the fundamental concrete object. There are going to be other people like Eddie or, or Shelley Goldstein or, or Tim Maudlin who are going to want to find ways of absorbing that part of it into the laws. So, so my hope is that the kind of examples that I went through in this talk are going to form a useful prelude to, um, to going through the same kinds of considerations in, in, in the context of quantum field theory. Whether that works out in detail once we get down to doing it is only going to be answered by, by doing it. But I agree with you that there's a, you know, I agree with you that that's a really important arena in, in which to consider these fundamental ontological questions. But an important question is also, of course, how, how you want to do the ontology of, of quantum field theory. So doing it in terms of fields is not at all obvious to me or whether there's this choice between fields and particles. I mean, uh -huh. it has to be a, some kind of a compromise but it's, it's, it's very likely to be, it, it's wrong to think in terms of fields as much as it's wrong to think in terms of particles in any naive classical way. Yeah? You're probably- it it's, it's own ontology and, and the way particle physicists do their accelerator experiments and so on, it's, it's kind of much more, much more natural to talk about particles. Yeah? And so right. this is, is much closer than to the particle type of arguments you were giving. So I think right. this kind of this kind of ontology could be um, maintained somehow for for quantum and, and should be for quantum maybe theory. um um and, and maybe the outcome actually of your of, of the, the the points you want right to and I know that that people who work in you know uh, uh, people who work on on Bohmian mechanics um, in particular or some people I work on Bohmian mechanics too but. Lots of the people who do work on Bohmian mechanics, I'm thinking especially here of people like Shelley Goldstein, think that the right ontology to carry this forward into quantum field theory with is indeed an ontology of particles. Um, um, so there's a very open question there. I guess I have a prejudice. I, I don't even know if it's worth mentioning, but but because um, because I don't know if I'm doing anything other than reporting my own prejudice here. Um, 
I find it easier to think about fundamental theories in which the stuff that you're identifying as basic ontology is persistent and the dynamics is just the story of changes in its state rather than changes in its existence, okay? Um, that's the way particles are in Newtonian mechanics. That's the way particles and fields are in Maxwellian electrodynamics. So I guess my first instinct is to think about something like quantum field theory in as close an analogy with that um, as I can. But whether that's worth anything at the end of the day, I'm just not sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Jacob, please go ahead. Thanks, Antonio. And David, that was a wonderful talk. Thank um, you. So I, I have a couple of, of questions. I had a few and then a few more came up that I think are, are, are um, more salient right now because of, of recent questions. So I, mm -hmm. I, I'll ask them somewhat out of the original order I'd intended. Um, so the, the first thing is, you know, uh, lo looking for useful, helpful, it, it, you know, even if heuristic criteria for trying to determine whether certain ingredients of a physical theory should be taken to be uh, ontic or, or nomic, um, I think could be helpful here. And there's there's one that I've been thinking about a lot recently. So um, when you consider, and I know you did, uh, Maxwellian electrodynamics, mm -hmm. um, you know, one one can can certainly uh, suppose that the electric and magnetic fields are part of the ontology, and that's a very natural way to work. That's, right. that's, that's very good. Um, very few people would say that the gauge potentials are right. the candidates for ontic things. Right. Now, why is that? That's a question for me. Yeah, it's a question <laughs> for anybody. Why, why, right. why is it that we don't, I mean, after all, gauge potentials are, are, are very simple. They have laws that in, in, in some ways are simpler than the laws of, of Maxwell theory. Right, but we can't, but we can't, you know, um, 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 we're worried about being able to measure them, I right. guess. Um, right. but there's um, that, big... that is, or, and this is saying the same thing as the earlier thing, we're worried that, um, um, uh, okay, let's leave it at that. Well, we're yeah, worried about so being we, able we, to measure We them. don't measure them directly. Right. What we, what we directly measure are electric magnetic forces, which are directly right. tied to the electromagnetic fields. Right. Um, but there's, there's a deeper problem, which is, which is gauge transformations, right? Mm -hmm. The gauge potentials are not uniquely defined. I can... Right alter them radically by arbitrary mathematical transformations that fall you know, within gauge transformations without altering any observable consequences of the theory. The electric magnetic fields are unchanged. Right. And so we're trained uh, you know, from an early age when we encounter this story not to take uh, gauge potentials um, uh, as, as, as good candidates for parts of the ontology, mm -hmm. but only to regard gauge invariant combinations of them, which include electric magnetic fields, they include right. the Arn of Bohm type phases as good right. candidates for things that are part of the ontology. Um, so in a, a paper a bunch of years ago, Harvey Brown noted that uh, there is a set of gauge transformations, not electromagnetic gauge transformations, um, gauge transformations directly on wave functions. Um, and I talk about this in a, in a, 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 a recent paper that, that, that uh, will be coming out soon um, as part of a, a larger, larger paper. But um, what you can do is you can take any wave function or state vector or even density operator uh, and perform an arbitrary unitary rotation on it, an arbitrary right. time dependent, importantly, time dependent unitary transformation on it. Right. Uh, this looks just like a zero plus one dimensional gauge transformation. And in fact, this is something you mean that's going to amount to an overall change of phase in a time dependent exactly. way or something like that. Right. Sort of. But, but it's more right. general than, than, than just yeah. a phase because it's right. a unitary rotation. So in an n dimensional yeah. Hilbert space, it's an n dimensional rotation. Good, good. good. Um, the wave functions and density operators uh, are, are not invariant under this operation by construction. Mm -hmm. The Hamiltonian transforms just like a gauge connection, like a gauge potential. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, you know, it has this sort of uh, unitary transformation plus this extra piece that shows up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this isn't to say that everything is therefore, you know, not invariant. There are some things that are invariant, expectation mm -hmm. values, probabilities, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which makes sense, of course. These are the concrete right. things that we can measure. These right. are the analogs of electric and magnetic fields, electromagnetic right. forces. Right. Um, but 
to me, this is screaming out that, you know, if we have, if we take as a criterion that when you've got ingredients in the theory that are, you know, not invariant under a, a huge class of gauge transformations that leave all the observable content the same, but can radically alter, uh, you know, those ingredients. Right. I can take any trajectory you give me of a wave function evolving for the Zorge equation and map it to any other trajectory I want under this transformation. Maybe not any wait. other possible trajectory. It, it, no, possible. wait, you couldn't map it into trajectories which have different size squares. No, at, that's, that's, at, I, right. I, I, I was, I had a caveat there, almost any okay. other trajectory, I, agreed, yeah. Okay. Um, but, but, uh, but, but, well, I, well, I'm not I, sure I, I'm not sure I, agree with the word almost there, but that doesn't matter. Okay. Go, go we, we could quibble over, yeah, I'd have right. to, we, we could look at the details, but, but the point right. is, to me, this makes me deeply suspicious. It, it, as a, This is an incredibly useful criterion. It makes me suspicious right. of taking wave functions seriously as part That's, of the Yeah, good. Um, um, uh, and, and, and also density operators for right. the same reason, because they're subject to the same kind of transformation, uh, uh, non invariant. So, you know, I, that, that's, that's one item and, and one I, I wanted to raise, but, but there's one that's more pertinent, I think, to Hans's question about quantum fields. Um, you know, there is one way in which the story of quantum fields does not differ from the story of particles merely in the details, but in mm -hmm. a much broader, like, starker sense. Um, we don't just have bosonic fields, we have fermionic fields. Mm -hmm. And fermionic fields differ from particles in, in a rather profound way. Particle degrees of freedom mutually commute. And that mutual commuting property means that they have wave functions, mm -hmm. right? This is mm -hmm. central. If you have a wave function defined over X, Y, and Z or over three n-dimensional configuration space, all those coordinates have to commute with each other. And that's true for bosonic quantum fields where we take the degrees of freedom to be the bosonic field values. Right. But fermionic fields don't commute with each other. Right, right. Their their local degrees don't commute. They don't have wave functionals. Right, um, uh, and and that that's that's not a, a details question. That's a that's a stark, radical difference that that you know half the particles in the standard model, half the fields in the standard model are fermionic fields, roughly. Um, so you know, this to me is another reason to be nervous. Unless, I mean, I don't, I don't know. So what object I mean, of, I don't yeah. just with reference to the second question. Yeah. Um, um, I think the jump is a little too fast there. They have wave functions in a certain abstract sense, okay? That right. is, you take any quantum field theory, you define a complete set of commuting observables for that theory, okay? Um, um, you define a space, each point in which assigns values to each member of the complete set of commuting observables. And you define a function over that. Okay. Um, um, that's going to be a function for a wave function for a quantum field. It's not going to be related to three dimensional space, even in the way that familiar quantum mechanical wave functions are right. related to three dimensional space. And that's going to be something to worry about in, yeah. in, in all kinds of ways. So I think it's maybe a tiny bit too fast to say there's no such thing as wave functions. Um, um, in a formal sense, I can define them in the way that I just in the way that I just described. But I think you are, I, I think there is a point there that um, um, that their relationship um, um, their relationship to something like three dimensional space is even more remote than the kind of relationship we get in multi-particle non-relativistic theories. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah, and and and, and I should say this is the only way to do it. I mean, uh, I know that um, uh, you know. Ward Struvia also has, you know, other proposals for how you can make right. wave functions show up for fermions. Right, right. They're qualitatively different from the kinds of. I I, I agree with this. I agree with um, that, and and also about the thing you were mentioning before. Um, I agree. I, I agree that prima facie, that's a good reason for saying, um, um, shouldn't our ontology be pinned to something other than wave functions? It is, as with all these things, going to matter. Going to be a matter of balancing 
that desiderata with other desiderata, that we come up with a clean, simple theory at the end of the day, um, um, yada, yada, yada. So yeah, uh, it, you know, certainly if the question is, shouldn't this go in the, in the balance pan um, um, on the side against taking wave functions ontologically seriously. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. That's sure. all I wanted to do. Inject a little bit of uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, this was a great talk. Thank, thanks Thank so you. Much. Thank you yeah, so I learned much. A lot from this. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Eddie, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks again. Um, so on the balancing point uh, that's mentioned earlier, David and Jacob, um, that we have a list of criteria but it's deciding between laws and physical things. I was wondering um, if there is a complete list we can consult, like, okay, here are 10 commands we have no. to respect, no. and here's the detailed weighting of them. Um, I was wondering um, what would be, I mean, this is kind of related to, um, you know, David, your own earlier work on uh, the metaphysics of the wave function, high dimensional space, mm -hmm. the criteria for fundamental physical space, right? Right, um, right. That we have the smallest, uh, simply such and such space for yeah um, yeah yeah right and so in the case of laws and matter i wonder if we should include other things as well and among the uh, criteria we have should we think of this unification of them or importing some deeper underlying reason for example um simplicity might be the deeper reason for various transition invariants symmetries and so on and on the side of matter perhaps we can say well here's another thing uh uh you know uh reaction and back reaction Right, and that's one consideration in favor of taking the quantum state to be a law. Right, um, just like Hamiltonian Good. function in classical mechanics. Good. Right, there's no back reaction in Hamiltonian, Good. so it's homological. In that case, we have any competing considerations. Um, so in the end, what is the what is the weighting here? What is the thing we have to? Uh, you got to, me, to do? Eddie. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I was, I'm being sincere here. Okay, when I say. I'm trying to open up a conversation here, okay? Because we really do have stuff to figure out here if we're gonna make further progress with this. Um, um, you know, exactly what the right way to do it, you know, and, and one can always such approach such problems in two different ways. Way one, and I just don't know which is better. Mm -hmm. Way one, Okay, before we even get started, I want a list of 10 principles along with their weights that are going to do the deciding. Okay, and there's another tendency to say, why don't you simmer down a little bit and let's just start feeling our way through this and, and see what kinds of choices present themselves and, and see what kinds of reasons for taking one path or another present themselves. And, and no doubt there is a, there are a continuum of procedures in between those two. And, and I, yeah, I'm just trying to open up, I'm just trying to open up the question yeah. here. I yeah. don't, I, I, I don't, if the question is, am I hiding up my sleeve, a, a list of 10 explicit criteria along with their weights, no, I promise. I got no sleeves at all. Okay. Um, 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 no, I don't know. Okay. We... I think I've raised some, I think I've, you know, if somebody, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the last thing I was discussing um, about your work. Okay. If it turns out that one, that, that you got two theories, which are otherwise equivalent, one of them endorses the accuracy of our records the other doesn't then the first one the first that that's a desiderata okay mm -hmm. there are tons and tons of desiderata here we're we're just trying to i mean i mean you know we're doing science here okay and we're and we're trying to we're trying to feel our way forwards i was wondering if um you are or we are guided by some um kind of fundamental principles of reasoning here. For example, um, so about metaphysics of laws, right? Yeah, yeah. Suppose we think laws are nothing but uh, systemization of the mosaic. Right. Um, uh, or suppose we think that laws are somehow governing laws that uh, govern or produce right. or constrain. Right. Um, do they um, 
constrict influence our waiting. I guess. I mean, here. you might and say. I was about this too. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. You, 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 somebody might say, for example, that the requirement that laws be simple or the desideratum that laws turn out to be simple might be might carry more weight for a union than it does for a necessitarian um, um, or something like that, because for a union, it's really part of the concept. Um, whereas for a necessitarian, it's not part of the concept, although presumably most necessitarians hope that the laws are going to come out fairly simple, that it's part of the aspiration of the scientific project. That, that the laws are going to come out fairly simple. So yeah, um, those kinds of considerations might make, might make a difference. I would think that most necessitarians, if they find they're becoming committed to grotesquely complicated laws, will be worried about that. Okay. Um, and I think there is something to this intuition that I was groping at, although I don't know how to make it much more explicit, that the messiness of the world is all about stuff and and the and the clean simple parts of the world are all about laws like i say for a union that's going to be part of the concept um, of law for a necessitarian not so much for for a governing mm -hmm. kind of view not so much so all kinds of things um, yeah. might might come you know might come in i, I there's no reason why this should turn out to be less complicated. Indeed, it's going to be more, you know, here's the, here's one way to put it, okay? Here's the terrible situation, you know? Once upon a time, basically before foundations of quantum mechanics, okay? Um, uh, you know, it, uh, a fashionable thing to say about worries about undetermination of theory by experiment, okay, was to say, you know, you people who worry about this, you have no idea what actually goes on in science, okay? Um, you're worried about having, having too many theories that are compatible with all the evidence. We're worried about just getting one theory that's compatible with all of the evidence, okay? And there have never been any realistic cases of having too many theories. Now we got them in spades, okay? And we're really gonna we're we're really gonna have to um, consider some of these other grounds for believing one thing, believing one thing or another. And I think it's I think vis-a-vis -vis the question of taking these questions seriously in the way we apparently have to in foundations of quantum mechanics, we're in pretty new territory here. And, and I, I don't think we know the right way to do it. And I certainly don't think we have these 10 commandments that, that you're asking for. Yeah. Um, one last point uh, mm -hmm. on the hidden the tension here between humanism and uh, the, one of the criteria about laws. Mm -hmm. That is um, the dynamical part should be this, this and that symmetric as an invariant and so Good, yeah, 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 and, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, You think about the human mentaculus as a whole, it is not time constant right. because of past hypothesis and still postulate. Um, so right. there is no right. um, fundamental metaphysical division between dynamical and- No, um, no, 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 laws. that's true. But- And even for mean P, for example, by the way, but mean primitivism, uh, unlike Maudlin's primitivism, we don't always insist on this metaphysical division between dynamical and non-dynamical laws. Right. But look, Eddie, this is, I, I agree with all of this. Um, I'm groping, you know, you and I sat in the Hungarian pastry shop on the Upper West Side of Manhattan for years and years talking about these issues. And it was an enormous help to me. Um, um, but, you know, in those conversations, I would say something and you would pull out a sheet of paper and say on such and such a date, eight years ago, you said exactly the opposite, okay? And you were always right, okay? Um, but this stuff is hard, okay? You know, you're asking too much of me. Um, um, we're groping, we're trying to figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, David. I hope they're still open in the pastry shop. Uh, uh, yeah, they survived the pandemic, yeah, yeah. Actually, 
you know, this is just gossip between me and Eddie in some completely inexplicable way because their coffee was always terrible. They became a huge hit after the pandemic. There are now lines around the block to get a coffee from there. I have no idea why. That's a miracle. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, Pedro, your question. Okay, thank you, Antonio, again. Um, so, I would like to to basically get right some remarks about the role of uh, the wave function in um, in your in your talk. And okay, I, I I'm glad to to hear that Eddie's is um, uh, this proposal uh, along those lines because I'm familiar with the uh, Sherry Goldstein collaborators. On, right. On so because. Uh, um, in the, in the case of uh, uh, Sherry Goldstein, um, it's not clear to me in what sense the wave function is really reduced to anything else because they, I mean, Shelley and, and uh, Sanghi and collaborators still have an equation that basically says how that wave function evolves. So, even if uh, it's true that in the, the more recent proposals that I'm aware of, and, and you said, there are basic ontology, it's one of particles. Mm -hmm. The fact remains that they still have a wave function that basically it's a kind of separate entity in, in my view. Um, if I got it right, and, and, and please Eddie, correct me because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with your proposal. If that's also the case, well, uh, there is a different uh, alter additional alternative to that in the sense that it's basically to have the wave function be completely reduced to the dynamics of your system. So it's kind of, uh, I like to think of the wave function as uh, basically Schrodinger in his uh, very early papers on, on, on the theory thought of is uh, like basically Hamilton Jacobi, basically he, that's the way he derived his uh, wave equation. So I like to think of, uh, of the wave function, of course, as a much more involved and, and complex uh, mathematical entity that Hamilton Jacobi function is in, in uh, uh, classical physics, but the fact remains that there are some promising work reducing the wave function basically to the curve that a dynamical system traces out on its corresponding um, configuration space. And it so happens that the configuration space is basically an elaboration of Julian shape space. Well, it's pretty much the same. So in that sense, it's no longer the case that you have some primitive ontology, never mind particles, fields, or what have you, and upon of that, a wave function that sort of uh, guides those uh, uh, that ontology, because the wave function itself is uh, reduced to basically the geometry that uh, is uh, imposed on that uh, curve on, on shape space. Uh, so well, I mean, I'm uh, I'm like you. I'm just uh, throwing in some uh, bold thoughts, and uh, perhaps uh, also Eddie may. Because if I got it right, I don't know to what extent the past hypothesis is crucial in Eddie's proposal. Because in in the in in this uh, elaboration of Julia's ideas, it's not past hypothesis is no longer there. So well. Yeah, sorry, I mean, perhaps too much. So if uh, I would like to hear your, your thoughts on, on, on that. Thank you. It, I mean, this may be more of a question for Eddie. Uh, it, it, I can say, um, um, it, no, well, I mean, for Eddie, perhaps- Shelley, they, they... I mean, Shelley is certainly not gonna deny that the wave function evolves okay i mean shelley has long hoped that there would be solutions where you have a 
um, where, where you have a static wave function. Um, so it wouldn't be evolving. And, and, you know, there's always a thought that this may have something to do with the problem of time in general relativity and but, so on and um, so forth. Okay, yeah. anyway, I'm just, I'm just trying to channel Shelley here, but Shelley never claims to have, have gotten anything like that. And the way things stand now, Shelley is certainly going to acknowledge that um, the wave function evolves in time. Um, still, he, he doesn't think that that disqualifies it from, um, from falling into the category of the gnomic. Look, you have to be, uh, it, it, I think it helps to recall the motivations, okay? The, the, I, I think the motivations for denying that the wave function has the status of a concrete physical object, okay, is that that seems to commit you to the claim that, that we actually live in this very high dimensional space and not the kind of high dimensional space that we live in in string theory, a high dimensional space, which is much more remote than, than that, in which each point represents a configuration of particles in the ordinary three-dimensional space. And, and there are people who have a visceral reaction to that, that that's just crazy, that it just doesn't make any sense to imagine that stuff floating around in a high dimensional space is somehow going to give rise to tables and chairs. Okay. It's like, it's, you know, and asking how things would need to be moving around in this high dimensional space in order to give rise to three dimensional tables and chairs is for them like asking how would oranges need to be moving around in order to give you an apple. Okay. They just think they've got nothing to do with each other. And there's this deep intuition that the fundamental physical theory of the world needs to have a fundamental three-dimensional space built into it. There are other people, myself, for example, who, who, um, 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 who think they see a way in which it could make perfect sense for the fundamental stuff to be floating around in this high dimensional space. So yes, the wave function has an equation of motion that makes it in, in some ways unlike other objects that we're used to thinking of as gnomic. But people like Shelley and like Tim Maudlin think there are very strong reasons for not entertaining um, the thought for, for doing what we need to do to get ourselves away from the thought that this is a, a concrete physical object. Eddie, Eddie, I don't know if you have something to say about this. Got a quick finger on that, but just quickly. Yeah. Um, sure. So this may just be my, my ignorance. I, I've read a lot of the papers on, on this, this question. Um, what's wrong with working in the Heisenberg picture? Um, um, I mean, why are you saying that now? You mean, because that would eliminate the need to... Yeah, there's some, to... there's some you know, initial density operator for the universe and right. it, doesn't, it doesn't change. Why about that? Right. Is, oh, is oh, so... I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah. oh, oh. It encodes, good. It encodes you know, so some quantum probabilities. Good, good, and good, then... good, good. Yeah, now, yeah. I, now I understand the proposal. Sorry. Look, so this is another interesting conversation, but, but probably an extended conversation. I've never understood. Um, um, if I try to take the Heisenberg picture as a serious ontological picture of the world, okay, I've always thought, and I think it's this reason, whether consciously or not, why almost all discussions of foundations of quantum mechanics take place in the Schrodinger picture, not in the Heisenberg picture. Here's, I think, why that is. Somebody says, okay, let's sit down for a minute and try to take the Heisenberg picture seriously as metaphysics, okay? Good. Um, the claim seems to be, let, let me give you an analogy. Somebody walks into a room, they say, here's my theory of the world, okay? 
um, there's a single particle sitting in a high dimensional space and it never moves and nothing ever happens to it. That's my theory of the world. And you say to this guy, what the hell are you talking about? Where are all the, the elections and the lawsuits and, and all the stuff that's going on and so on? Guy says, you don't understand. Um, um, the fundamental picture is that there's just this particle, but the rules for translating the properties of this particle into prosaic language of tables and chairs and lawsuits, those rules are very complicated and highly time dependent. Okay. Um, you say, that's a crazy theory. Couldn't we do any better than that? I mean, I mean, couldn't we, shouldn't the relationship between the fundamental stuff and the tables and chairs and lawsuits be more transparent than that? I'm, my understanding of the Heisenberg picture taken seriously as a metaphysical picture is that it's exactly that. I mean, that isn't even a cartoon of it. That's exactly what it is. Okay, somebody's telling me, no, 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 the things that change with time are the rules that, that by which you translate the fundamental language into the nun. I, I say the rules are the things that there's dynamics for. I don't even know what rules are if we're having a serious ontological discussion. Um, so this is why I think in, in the context of discussions of the foundations of quantum mechanics, of the metaphysics of quantum mechanics, nobody ever talks about the Heisenberg picture. And I think that, I, I mean, I haven't heard even, it, the, the, the extent to which nobody talks about it is so complete that people don't even have discussions about why they don't talk about it. But I think the reason must be something like that. I think if I try to take this seriously, we're talking about a picture like the one I just described. I mean, does that, do you, do you how do you react well, to that, Jake? I mean, so the first thing I would say is in principle, one could imagine, you know, your ontology consisting of a particle in a very high dimensional configuration space where it's position encodes all the information that you need. Right. Uh, and then you it's, have, you know, incredibly complicated, you know, arcane right. set of rules, but the Heisenberg pictures rules are pretty simple. They're, they're not really that much more. No, they're not. What are you talking picture. about? You evolve the thing a little bit and the position op, what was once the position operator yeah. becomes this incredibly complicated thing. Okay. No, I don't think they're, I don't think they're that, you know, you, well, you want to do it mean by simplicity. Cause you want to, like, you want to do a better analogy. Sure. Let the part, let the position of the particle represent the initial conditions of the world, okay? Right. That particle picks out a whole trajectory of the world, okay? But the way it picks it out is by, it, the way it picks it out in the language of tables and chairs is by means of rules, which immediately after the initial instant start to get really, really complicated, okay? And highly time dependent. And I guess what I would say I wouldn't say, which I think people like Shelley would, this theory, this theory is just a priori unintelligible, okay? But I guess I would say, is that the best you can do? Okay. Well, I, I, I think the, just, just to, you know, I mean, this is, this is obviously a very arguable point, but what I, mm -hmm. I, one, one last argument I would just make is this is what people who work in foundations of QFT do. Um, the, um, the algebraic, you know, algebraic right. QFT people who do foundations right. of QFT, they're right. all working from the Heisenberg picture. Uh, they would yes. say that the Schrodinger picture is completely unintelligible. But you, look, talking about foundations the here can mean two different foundations. You, you're making a kind of pun on foundations. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. The right. people that you're referring to as foundational are people who are trying to get a mathematically coherent framework. Um, um, the other meaning of foundational, which is the one we've been using here, is we're trying to get a, a metaphysical picture of what's going on, right? And of course, the first is necessary for the second, okay? Um, um, I agree with that. And yes, I, I know that they do that. I don't know what to say. If, if the way we're going to end up is with a Heisenberg picture, that's going to be... 
that's going to be so somebody just tells me and I really try to I sit there in my room and I try to get into this into my head it's not the world that's changing with time it's the translation from the fundamental language to the language of tables and chairs that's changing with time I I, I like I say I I don't I don't have an argument that that's unintelligible I guess I would say Gee, I was hoping for something more transparent. I, I would just say in, in, in closing, I, I do agree that I was being a little bit glib by saying foundations of QFT, but I would yeah. argue that in addition to being interested in the mathematical foundations of QFT, right, right. I, you know, a lot of the people working in financial QFT sure. are interested in the meta sure. metaphysics also. No, 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 sure. And, yeah. and, and, and indeed, that, is, that is part of part of the motivation for trying to get absolutely. a better mathematical understanding. I, I agree with it. I agree yeah. with it. So You're anyway, right. I, I'll, I'll stop there. I'm not, I'm not wedded to, the, to this idea, but I just thought right. it, was, it was an interesting thing. I don't think anything should ever be dismissed out of hand. Absolutely. And, 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 and the, the, your point is correct that people don't even ask why it's being dismissed. That, that's, that's mm -hmm. not good philosophy. Right, so, right, yeah. right. Great, we are approaching the ending of the session. So I don't know if Eddie has a quick follow-up and then Hans. Okay, quick follow up to uh, Pedro and David Jacobs discussions on the nomological status of the wave function. I think in the literature right now, there are three schools. One is something that neither David and I um, endorse and like uh, is the, um, um, the quantum humans. Uh, so uh, Michael Asfeld um, and this is Miller, uh, Harji uh, Bogo and Z Perry, uh, for which they recommend that the wave function is part of the best system, and they're not very worried about the complexity issue or uh, the loss of symmetries. Uh, I am much more worried about the uh, complexity issue and loss of symmetries. And so, so if Shelley, so Shelley had this other interpretation in which the weight, the weight equation is an essential conjecture that hopefully that's the right law of quantum gravity for the universal wave function, and that might deliver us not only time, time independent wave function but also a simple wave function. For me, I don't rely on the weight equation, but rely on the past hypothesis, the density matrix formalism. I combine this into one tackless package using the initial density matrix to get to a simple quantum state that is nomological, but it does lose time transition invariance, which I argue is not a problem, but actually um, a feature and a nice kind of symptom for unification in the picture. Okay. But in all of these pictures, what is fundamental for the Bohmian picture is particles in three space or four space time for GW maybe collapses and flashes. And uh, in many worlds interpretation, arguably it will be some kind of meta density field that can be decohered into branches because of the quantum state phenomenological. Okay, it, it's, it's more common. I, I, I hate wave functions, I must say. And I think they are a very misleading object. And the, the, the reason is, first of all, I have to square these beasts before I get anything. And then I have this continuity of the, of the Schrodinger equation, which is really against the spirit of quantum jumps. I mean, this is also nicely continuous. Everything flows like in the Maxwell equations and it's, it's patterned like that. And I have a superposition principle and the superposition principle causes a lot of problems. So I think our life would be much better without the wave function. And that does not mean that I have to leave Schrodinger's picture. It, it doesn't need to be, um, Heisenberg picture on the other side, I think that an easy step is to go towards density matrices. And in density matrices, the world looks completely different. Um, the superposition has a, a completely different standing there. And superposition is, is related to entanglements, but entanglements can be realized in very different ways in, 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 in the setting of density matrices. As we know, the, the density matrices can also be the foundation of a, of a, a uh, a particle-like picture in, 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 in the sense of, of, of Bohm, um, so that, that would also work. Yes, so let's forget all about the, the, the damp Schrödinger wave function and have the more direct object, which you don't have to square, but you take a trace with. And so the option there is to go back into Hilbert space by looking for unravelings as stochastic processes which on average produce density matrices. And these pieces are then the ones which can be the basis for ontology because you might not like to work with density matrices directly for an ontology, 
But if you work with stochastic unravelings of density matrices in Hilbert space, then there is the need for a Hilbert space on top of just doing superpositions all the time, which it's kind of inviting to. Um, then you get a, a, a much clearer picture of how how um, how the interpretations could go rather than these continuous superposition like type of wave functions, which, which is really a big obstacle, but everybody speaks to, to that. Uh, so I think in unravelings of density matrices, we would have a much easier life. That, that is my comment for, for fundamental discussions. Um, I don't, so I welcome the comment and uh, uh, yeah, I'm anxious, you know, if things, if things really make a lot more sense in that language, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to hear about that. Can I ask a quick clarification question? Of me? Yeah. Yeah. About the two particle case for the embedding strategy. When you have the embedding into your, how do you get determinism back? For the two masses in a, in a spring. Oh, you uh, the the determinism do, the the determinism goes from that is what determines the trajectory is an is an arbitrarily short interval, not an instant. I see. But don't we have that already for um, this relational uh, mechanics itself without embedding? I think about um, so the uh, Leibniz and debate with the. Um, so they will worry about indeterminism here, and um, if you just given the short interval, then they will have the data to calculate what's going to happen next. Yeah, yeah, no, this is. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm okay. I'm familiar with this from uh, not from the Leibniz Newton debate, although maybe it's in there. Uh, Poincaré said stuff okay, like I this. I see. I see. Um, yeah. Involving taking the second derivative. Right. as as part of the initial conditions um, or something like that. But yeah, it's exactly that's, I think it's a little cleaner to state it this way. And it brings up the issue explicitly uh -huh. of absorbing the space into the laws. But yeah, I think that's the same. So, so the embedding requires both the state of time, but also the change. The state the over an arbitrarily short interval. Right, right, nice. Nice. right. Okay, that helps. Okay, I was confused there. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Oh.